Welcome to the Joma Preventative Health Podcast, hosted by the Jewish Orthodox Women's Medical Association. We provide you with up-to-date information on health topics geared towards the Orthodox Jewish community. This podcast content is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended as medical advice or as a substitute for the medical advice of a physician. Welcome to the Jewish Orthodox Women's Medical Association, or JOMA, podcast. I'm your host, Elisa Minkin. I'm a general pediatrician and a proud JOMA member. And today I'm really, really honored and really, really excited to be here today with Bracha Getz. Before I introduce her, I'm going to remind you, please reach out to us at health, H-E-A-L-T-H, at joma.org for any suggestions, um, comments, people you want to be interviewed. If you yourself want to be interviewed, a topic you want to hear about, we want to hear from you. So Baracha Getz. Baracha Getz, by the way, reached out to me, and I was so, so excited because she inspired me with her poems that I read when I was staying home with my kids, which was a really challenging time working, you know, to help my daughter with disabilities. And I had, I had dropped out of medicine for a while and Bracha Getz actually went to Harvard, started medical school and left. To, she became from after, and um, she talks a little bit about this journey um, in our interview, but it was really inspirational to me that there could be different phases of life. Um, and it was inspiring to me when I was staying home with my kids during that phase. So Bracha Getz is the Harvard-educated author of now 41 Jewish children's books and a candid memoir for adults about her journey in Judaism. Her books can be found in Jewish bookstores and at her website, www.getzbookshop.com. That is spelled www.getzbookshop.com. Welcome, Bracha. Thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. So I'm super excited. I, I literally, just before we started, we were talking and I told you how excited I am. I'm so excited because you reached out to me <laughs> to be interviewed. And as I was telling you, when I was home with my kids, you gave me a lot of physical, a lot of spiritual sustenance while I was home with my kids. So I want to thank you publicly. Thank you, Bracha, thank <laughs> for you. your poems that had inspired me. Um, and I didn't know that you wrote, I think it's up to 40 one 42 books yeah yeah 41 children's books right yeah yeah we have to update your bio it says 40 because you wrote another book (laughs) while I was waiting to interview you (laughs) (laughs) so I'm really excited and I do want to focus on book number 40 um um for for at least part of the interview which is let's stay healthy not just let's eat healthy yes yeah so we're going to get to that later but I didn't know how passionate you are about keeping children healthy in body and soul. So I'd like everybody to hear a little bit of your background to give some context to this passion, please. Okay, sure. Um, well, I, was, I wasn't brought up orthodox and I was searching for something. I didn't know what. Something was missing from my lovely life, which was really a nice life, but I didn't feel complete. So I actually, the reason I went to Harvard is because I was searching for wisdom. I feel, I felt this must be the ultimate place to get wisdom. So I, I had a lot of curiosity and I love to learn about things. So I studied hard. I got in there and um, then actually I went on to medical school after I graduated. I wanted to be a psychiatrist. The problem was actually though, I was, um, developing eating disordered behavior while I was there at Harvard. And it got to the worst point of all when I was in medical school. So I looked like a success on the outside, but in the inside, I was suffering. Something was missing and I was genuinely hungry, but it wasn't a physical hunger. Although I thought, you know, I could never be satisfied. It It was like binge eating. Uh, fluctuating with very restricted dieting. So you couldn't even tell I had a problem from looking at me, but inside I was suffering. It's like being in a prison. So um, 
that summer after my first year in medical school, I had a six week break. I went to Israel and I learned about my heritage, which basically had been thrown away. I, 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 the, the title of my memoir is Searching for God in the Garbage because I was searching in the garbage for the heritage that had been tossed. So when I found it, there was no turning back. I knew I had to immerse myself and this brought me immediate joy. The funny thing is I couldn't understand why the eating disordered behavior kind of just started to melt away as I nourished my hungry soul. It was, it was an amazing thing because I found what was missing from my life. And I was really never running on empty again. It was never that desperate hunger that I had during those years. So I began very soon after getting married and having children. I, when I had two little children, I started writing children's books. I, I would sit outside in Israel and write while my children were playing. I, I sent the first manuscript in an envelope, put it in an envelope, sent it to America. About six weeks later, I got an answer back that it was accepted. And I realized, wow, wow. wow. I, so I just <laughs> really became orthodox very recently, but I have something to contribute, I realized, you know, like, wow, I can offer something. This was amazing for me. So that was how it began, that I began to write. That, that's books. incredible. I want to go back a little bit. Um, first of all, it's a common story, by the way, what you've been through. And it's also not only do you have something to contribute, but we have benefited so much from all the people who became from and brought in their backgrounds, right? So it's right. not that you throw it away. I, I have a couple of things to say. First of all, I read Searching for God in the Garbage, and it is a really powerful memoir, um, but I'm going to give a trigger warning for people <laughs> um, because I recently got a, an email about trigger warnings needed for another podcast that I did. I interviewed a medical student um, who's in recovery from eating disorder. And we actually went back and edited out some of the details. And it, apparently these details can be very, very triggering for someone either with an eating disorder or vulnerable for one. So I'm gonna put it out there. And I have to say that when you said searching for God in the garbage, when you were binge eating and actually looking in the garbage and eating, the leftovers in the garbage. I had to put that book down and walk away. It was very hard for someone, even without an eating disorder, to read that. It was so painful. But I also want to say, we talked about this before, that there's a different scenario when you grow up in a nurturing home environment without specific traumas, but you don't have the spirituality as you had. And for, unfortunately, people who may have an eating disorder in addition to other things or just other complex reasons, eating disorders are extremely complex. And we don't want to make it sound like the simple magic magic pill is religion, especially because religion can be misused, right? And in that same interview, I had to listen to it recently to edit it. She said something that broke my heart. She said, I was davening every day, please Hashem, let me be thinner, let me lose weight, please Hashem, let me lose weight, right? So we don't want to confuse the two or confuse people listening, right? But that's your story. That's your story and that's your experience. And it's, it's really important. And it really led you to take that and, and bring it to children at an early age, right? So I'm gonna let you go back to your story. Yes, exactly. And what, what goes across all religions, because I speak a lot to, to Jewish groups and non-Jewish groups, what goes across everybody is filling up our souls with gratitude. Judaism is based, we are the thankful people. That's what our Judaism, that's the essence of Judaism, but it's across the board. It's a universal thing. Then when we fill our lives with mindful gratitude, this is how we really fill up in life because the food, it's meant to bring pleasure, but it's meant to bring gratitude. It's meant to nourish our hungry souls. Without that part, will remain hungry. So when we, when we also nourish our souls with the natural good foods, we are filled with gratitude. That's, that's, what, that's what happens, yeah. That's beautiful. I see you brought an orange for people who are listening to the podcast and you can't see the orange. 
it, you know, and I'm just thinking about it, the backwards way of looking at it is even though you did have a nurturing background, you still felt so empty. And yeah, so I see I myself think- as like a control. You know, if you right. take away everything else, I didn't have the trauma. Right. All I was missing in my life was the spiritual sustenance. That's it. And still, I developed these eating disorder behavior, which I think is really interesting. You know what I mean? And that's why I didn't need, you know, intense therapeutic intervention as well. Other people might need that right. to help remove all the clipot, all the coverings that that are put on us to protect us. We've put on coverings to protect us from pain. I, With me, when I found that nourishment, it went right in. You know what I mean? I didn't have you were all parched. these you were other parched. layers. Yeah, you were parched exactly. just waiting for water. Exactly. Yeah, that, 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 that really is so true. Um, but what I love about your books is you must have thought, hey, why didn't I get this when I was really little? And even in from families, right, it's not an automatic thing just because you didn't grow up from, even if you had grown up from, would you have learned all these things is the question. It's true. You see, sometimes people that are FFBs, they're, they're brought up from, from birth. It becomes almost just a cultural right. experience instead of it being a spiritual experience. So my children are always saying, we are so lucky to be the children of Bale Chuva, you know, because we have such an awareness of we have both, we have both. Right. We are FFBs and we have the appreciation of how awesome it is to have these guidelines in our lives, which other people may take for granted. Yes. But I don't even think it's just about appreciation. I think, and this is what I love about your books, it's about specifically teaching. Like you may think it just comes with your mother's milk, but you actually break down so many concepts (laughs) for young children that they might not learn otherwise. Yeah, that's, that's like, I feel the essence of who I am. Mm-hmm. I love to take deep and complex topics or sometimes difficult topics that are hard to discuss, simplify them. That is what I feel is one of my main purposes for being here. That is what I love to do. And it mm-hmm. comes naturally to me. Um, I, I, my brain thinks a lot like a child. So this is how it naturally writes like that because I never lost that sense of curiosity and wonder. So um, I'm kind of identifying as a six-year-old boy for some reason. And that's <laughs> like, the, <laughs> that's that's amazing. <laughs> I know, I know I'm saying it on that's purpose. Like it. <laughs> I'm saying it on purpose because that, <laughs> That it, that's the character I usually am when I'm writing the books. That's yeah. hilarious. That is so cute. But again, going back to teaching when they're young. I mean, this is just getting to my absolute heart. First of all, I have never grown up either. A pediatrician, I get to be a kid forever. <laughs> <laughs> we should not grow up. It's not, it's adulthood is overrated. <laughs> Number one. God, God but, willing. But, but, but seriously, the idea of getting to children when they're young teaching gratitude skills and their skills, right? It's not simply, oh, you should be grateful. It is broken down. Teaching health skills, which is what, you know, I was very tempted to go down the emotional regulation, you know, route with you because you have some books that really go there, but I'm going to stay with the, with the healthy stuff um, because I have to pick something in your 41 books and we could be here all day. Um, But also just in terms of, in a way it's more concrete. Like there are very specific things that many families, not just not Orthodox, but Jewish, anybody, doesn't realize they need to specifically teach. Right. And so I want to talk, I want to actually go back to um, one of your, probably your best known book, which is Let's Stay Safe. Yeah. And I, I'd love to hear about the background of that book because yes. of all your books, I think this one, I mean, you have so many good books, but I think this one has got to have had the biggest impact. Yes, it has. And no, it's 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 an incredible. Exp- First of all, even when I was an undergraduate at Harvard, I was taking courses at Harvard's Graduate School of Public Health. Public health has always interested me. I was taking courses at at Harvard Medical School and at the Harvard School of Public Health and Harvard Graduate School of Education. So these were always my interests, and so helping 
the public health situation of the Orthodox community was so important to me. I was working for almost 20 years um, coordinating a Big Brother, Big Sister program, a Jewish Big Brother, Big Sister program. So I became very familiar with the, with the literature about abuse and went to so many seminars and workshops in this field. And we had to weed out people that wanted to become bigs for the wrong reason. It was like, we had to be really experts in this field. So um, I saw that in the Orthodox community, we were behind in this. We were not teaching the children about proactively how to prevent abuse and, and parents. And I, I hadn't taught my children either. I never learned about this to teach them. It's, it's, it's incredible. So I, from all that I knew, I was able to write books about this. The first book, I, I, I sent it to every publisher and nobody was interested in publishing it. I also wrote articles about it for all the Orthodox magazines and newspapers. Only the Jewish press would publish my articles on the subject, but no other. And it actually caused some, some arguments to take place I heard on board meetings. Some people wanted it, others were against it. It was, and I couldn't get the books published. So, I turned to Rabbi Yaakov Horowitz and he said, we're going to get this done. So he, um, I sent him my first manuscript and it's actually the book that came out second. But while we were working on that book being accepted, I got this idea, wait a minute, how about if we just do it? I got the idea from Debbie Fox, who was doing the safety kid videos. She was way ahead way ahead of me too. She was doing these things before me in California and LA. So um, have it just be another normative safety measure. Stick it in the middle of the book, you know? So I, and of course the other safety measures are important as well. So we need to learn about this. So that's what we did. And I rewrote, um, I wrote a different manuscript and Rabbi Harwood's pushed it through with Art Scroll. So then like just before it was about to be published, they wanted to take my name off of the book. They were really afraid of the backlash. They were publishing it and they were also terrified at the same time. I said, I am not at all afraid of backlash, but I didn't have much say in that. Mm -hmm. And my name came off the book, but the book came out I, I really, I didn't want to even fuss about this because I wanted the book out. I didn't want one more child mm. to suffer. Get that book out. So the book came out and Rabbi Horowitz really worked so hard to get it in. I think it's close to 150,000 homes now. Baruch Hashem, it is awesome. And he made different types culturally appropriate for different groups in Israel it's in Hebrew it's in Yiddish and um it, it, and it, they change the illustrations for different for different to, so everybody can relate culturally and nobody everyone would want it in their home so that happened in 2011 but by 2014 the manuscript I'd written first came out and that was um let's talk about private places which later became Let's talk about personal privacy. And um, there they were no longer afraid. My book, my name could be on the book. <laughs> the stigma had already changed. That was three years time. This book was only on that subject. It's a whole different experience now. And it's about, you know, how, how to respect and treasure your bodies. They're so precious. And what to do, how, how, to respond if a person has been molested, what, what, and how to prevent. You know, the the book, the whole focus of the book was on that as opposed to the first book. Yeah, this is this is so so incredible. And I did you know go back and, and Google and find out you know how active you were in in trying to prevent abuse even before the book came out. So kola kavod to you. You're one of the pioneers, and you mentioned of course Debbie Fox and. Rabbi Harwood, these are incredible people who really faced a lot of struggle to get the word yeah. out there. And, and even now, we're, we have a long way to go. We have a long way to go. 
but we have to celebrate how far we've come right. too. Right. Yes, right. exactly. And, and I did, I did, I want to say that for people listening to this, please go look at the rest of my talks. I did um, actually two interviews with Rachel Bayar um, by the time your talk is out, her second talk should be out, it's not out yet. Um, I talked about um, online safety with her as well, because that's an area now that in 2022 is a huge problem that everybody needs to be aware of, even if you don't use the internet, because um, your kids can still potentially access it. Um, and also just general um, sex abuse prevention with Rachel Bayar, who founded the Bayar Group. She's a former um, sex abuse crime prosecutor. And she, if, if you use Instagram, she is an amazing, amazing resource because one thing she says over and over is it's not one conversation. It's not you've read this book and you're done. It's the idea that you wanna to convey to your children that you can tell me anything, that no matter what happens, I will always love you and it's not your fault. And that is a relationship concept. It's not an information concept. I think people want a magic pill for everything and this is a terrifying, terrifying thing. And so they want, okay, I've got the book. Are my kids safe? I've read it once, my kid's safe. And I will say that I love your book, Let's Stay Safe, so much more than the, there are books out there that are more specific, um, at least as a start. I don't think that it should ever be the end, even if you read it over and over and over, even your um, Let's Talk About Personal Privacy, these are the beginning, right. not the end. But you know what? I think that we have to not let perfect be the enemy of the as good as we're going to get. And I think that's really important because, you know, we had this, of course, I'm not even going to mention the name of the person, but this whole issue that came out last year, a terrible, terrible um, case of multiple abused children and adults. Um, and everybody talked about it more, which is good. But I think people will look for magic, you know, cures and there is no magic cure. Right. And so I did a talk with, um, I did a talk with Gelia Safsky, who is a Hasidic play therapist um, who's dealt with this, unfortunately, a lot. And we were talking about talking about private places. And somebody said, but you must use the body part names. You must use the body part names. Teach the child the proper body part names. And in Hasidic homes, they will not do this. You can't insist on that. And interestingly, as a pediatrician, I find this is a culturally common thing. It's more common than not. They come up with these other names and they're not comfortable with using the body part names. And if you insist on that, you're letting perfect be the enemy of the as good as you're going to get. Beautiful. Yeah. I think it's really important. Beautiful. I totally to, agree. Yeah. yeah. To, to convey the comfort with the topic. And that reason I love your book so much, I read it to my granddaughters and I felt comfortable reading it to them as a grandmother and not, you know, as a parent. First of all, I love that it the, the book Let's Stay Safe has lots of different safety topics because you automatically feel like I can't talk about this. And then it just worked in there and you could kind of follow the lead of your children and have great conversations or your grandkids, depending on what's appropriate. So I, I do want to mention a book that is not yours for a second because there's I I never do advertisements. This podcast is not an advertisement for your books. <laughs> I just want to mention this because Geli Yasovsky uses this book and she's Hasidish. So I know that this can be used in multiple homes with adjustments. Um, this is a secular book. This is called I Said No, A Kid to Kid Guide for, to Keeping Private Parts Private by Zach and Kimberly King. Um, and it is a secular book. It does have some, you know, um, talk about body parts for people who are comfortable with using them. But it gives you the option to say private parts if you, that's what you want to do. And I find that's universally accepted. And it's pretty simple for a four to eight-year-old with more detail, all right? So not everybody's ready. I, To be completely candid, I gave this to my daughter and she hasn't read it to my grandchildren yet. <laughs> and I'm not going to do that either. <laughs> so you see the point that I'm making, right? The, the point is that you have to start somewhere. And I think that your books are so incredibly valuable. And it's incredible how 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 many homes have them now. And when I went on, on Amazon, you had 95 star reviews for that book, for the hardcover version. And someone said that there was uh, at least one case of abuse that was um, dealt with properly or prevented because of your book. Oh, oh, I get calls. Yes, absolutely. That's what's happening. The ch parents contact me to let me know this. Yes, it's wonderful. Um, and like you said, it 
opens the conversation because that could be difficult to do for a parent. It's uncomfortable. This makes it no longer uncomfortable. It's, I try to make these difficult topics, present them really in a calm, clear, and joyful way. The, the pictures are joyful. It's, that's, that's what we need in order to absorb things readily. And another point that you made, I, what, I, what I write about in different articles is it's kind of like a, pedi a pediatric checkup, an annual checkup. You have to repeat, you have to keep checking that the children understand as their lives change, as they become more sophisticated in their development, it's, it's, uh, you check, keep checking in with them about how things are going in this area. It's, it's really important. Yes. It really, really is. And again, the pictures also, they are, they're great. It's, it gives you a great chance to talk to the kids about all kinds of things. And because the topics are mixed together, right? All the safety topics are mixed together. It normalizes it as just another safety topic. Right. And one other thing I want to mention that you said is one of my books, Let's Stay Pure, is about the prevention of too much, too much schmutz like from the internet and things like that going into a child's mind. How, how, how careful we need to be with what goes into their pure neshamas. Yeah. Yeah, right. it's true. That the, the problem that I have, though, is that, and I'm just going to be honest because I'm always going to be honest. <laughs> the problem I have is that you always want children to feel comfortable telling you everything. So if they're yes. told this is bad and they feel guilty, they won't tell you. Yes, right? absolutely right. No, you're, you're right. The relationship is key. Yeah. That openness is key. Still, it's helpful for children to know right. how good it is for them. Yes, the, exa you're exactly right. Right, right but it also, it, is, it also is preventative. I love the preventative idea here that your books are all preventative, which is like part right. of me as a pediatrician and a mother and a baby prevention is right. so better than dealing after the fact with something that happened. Exactly. Already. Oh my right. gosh, your right. baby right. books are my favorite baby books ever. <laughs> Those are the first ones <laughs> the I bought for my books. I love those books. And again, the pictures, they're just pictures. But like I've heard you be interviewed and say, there's so many things you can talk about at different ages. So again, yeah, I don't do advertisements here, but I'm just a big fan. <laughs> you know, it's true. The, 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 the board books that I write for the toddlers, I, I, had, I was reading a book to my oldest granddaughter. And I said, we should have a book like this for toddlers. I was reading a book from the library to um, um, to my granddaughter, I said, we should have a book where you could see through Jewish eyes from the very beginning of life, mm -hmm. little babies. Mm -hmm. So that's how the board books came about. The let's stay, let's, um, what do you see on, on Shabbos? What do you see on Hanukkah? What do you see at home? To, to see the world through Jewish eyes, through, through Jew, Jewish joyful eyes from the very beginning. Right? Oh, they're beautiful. So I really want to talk about let's stay healthy. I think we can talk about that now. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, I love this sure. too. And by the way, I called it um, um, accidentally let's eat healthy because so much of it is about healthy eating. And I actually love it that you called let's stay healthy. It's kind of parallel to let's stay safe in the sense yeah. that eating is so fraught. I mean, here you are recovered from an eating disorder, right? I mean, our culture has so much problems with body image and shaming and weight shaming and all this kind of stuff. And so to talk about healthy eating in the context of other healthy behaviors, did you do that on purpose? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I'm sorry, let me let you talk. Yeah. And in, in a joyful way, the whole thing is, I, I love this. I learned that it takes 400 repetitions to form new synapses in the brain, to create a new habit. If we do it joyfully, 10 to 20 repetitions and we've got it down. So these books, it's if we want to inculcate good new habits in our children, doing it joyfully is key. And so the book explains why. Because, you know, so many parents will say, you know, eat your vegetables, not the junk food, but why? Children want to know why. So that's what I'm attempting to explain in a very basic way in this book, that, that it really 
the junk food actually draws out the good stuff from our bodies. It's it it's really is harmful to us. It's not um, innocuous at all. It it's it actually has a harmful effect on us, and we are here to guard our bodies and to take as as good care of them as possible. That's part of our guidelines for life and from the Torah. So the book is explaining why we need to get back on course. And I, I, I use what's happened, how the how my books have affected changes in abuse to, to hope that we can also affect changes in health mm -hmm. because it's widespread. One of my grandsons had a Rebbe who gave out colored masking tape as prize, as, as a reward for, um, instead of junk food, instead of sodas and candy. And all the boys wanted this colored masking tape and they made amazing sculptures, like incredible. They made Beis Hamigdash, Kotel, they made, you know, Eiffel Towers and um, amusement parks, like you wouldn't believe the sculpture. They had a blast and it, it affects their lives so much better than all that junk right. that is widespread given out as rewards. Yeah. That's awesome. How can we get that out to the other schools? <laughs> yeah, that's, we'll this is what everywhere. I want to, exactly. Mm -hmm. it, you know, we want people reading the book in a joyful way and spreading these messages far and wide so that it will become much more mainstream in and 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 in, in in schools and at home because if the home is promoting one thing and the schools a different thing it's very hard who needs that battle if we're all on the same page more and more it's so much more pleasant so you know and, and same thing with the prevention of abuse we need the schools and the and the families on the same page the same with healthy eating i, I say that what do all my books have in common it, they're all to help souls to shine, but our souls can shine most fully within healthy bodies. It's so important. It's an important part of letting our souls shine fully is to also do all that we can. And we have so much power to so many, they say like, they're giving percentages now, like 95% of illnesses can be controlled by lifestyle. It's amazing. I mean, so much is genetic, but there's a part that's genetic, but so much is within our own control to lead a healthier lifestyle by, and the book covers healthy eating, exercise, sleeping, getting enough sleep, and, and good hygiene. Because I mean, I was never into washing with soap when I was a child. Like, why should I bother? And now I get it, you know? The germs are invisible. I, I now I understand that we really need the soap, you know. And like another thing I never did as a child, I brushed my teeth, but I never knew about flossing. Now, now I know about what a difference it makes. Oh my gosh, later on in life. Like you were saying, I try to teach skills so that we don't have to play catch up the rest of our lives. Right. Teach right. them early on. If you get these skills early on about how to be grateful, how to be joyful, how to be a giver, how to protect yourself in life, then you will be able to avoid a lot of unnecessary pain later on in life. And you'll be able to, be, to live, God willing, a much more productive life. That is so beautiful. I love that. I really, really do. And I also read this book to <laughs> my grandkids. I did. And they loved it. Their favorite page was the serial page. Yes. <laughs> the junkie yes. cereal. And you made it fun. You know what I mean? It's not boring. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> With the funny names for the cereals. Yes. Yes. The, the illustrations are awesome. And the, having these conversations again, like you said, repeat, repeat, repeat early, early, early. That's really yes. the best way to do it. And of course, to model it. It's not just about reading about it. You can't read about it. <laughs> Not and actually. joyful and joyful right. exactly right and not shaming there's no reason to make any of these habits about shame right exactly totally so some people say to me it's not right to say 
it's not right to label some food as bad. Right. Well, I say this, the food, the junk food is purposely designed to be as delicious and addictive as possible. While the natural foods are designed to be as delicious and nutritious as possible, they are totally different things. And we've had so much infiltration of information about how great the junk food is. Commercials, billboards, every place you see, even in the from magazines, and you'll see pictures. I right. mean, it's everywhere. So we, so it's fine to counteract that because there's tons of that information. Right. We need also to be educated what it's really doing to our bodies. It's not harmless. We, we would never water a plant that we love with soda. We would not do that, but we'll give it to our children. That makes no sense. We, a plant in a few days would die if it was watered with soda. You can do that experiment. Let your children see it, but we're, we're stronger than the plant, you know? So we're, that doesn't happen to us. It's, it's, it doesn't happen quickly like that, but it's, it's heading us in a, in a negative direction. Yeah. So. I find as a pediatrician, most, not all, but most people know about soda. What they don't realize is how much sugar is embedded in our food. Yes, that's right. And that's a bigger like problem. Like cereals. Mm -hmm. Cereals, it's unbelievable. We think that it's something healthy to eat, but look at the sugar content. Just right. read the labels. Yeah. Right. And, and children could do that now. Exactly. It's empowering children. Yes. If, if sugar is at the top of a list, watch right. out. It's It doesn't do anything good for us. It actually drains our bones of our nutrients. It makes our bones weaker. Children want to be strong and grow. It's not helpful. I love the idea of empowering kids because otherwise parents get into a power struggle. Yes, exactly. All my books, I, 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 if you see, it's that main character. He's six years old and he's Your telling everybody boy. what he learned. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really stuck on that one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's awesome. We have a few minutes um, and I really appreciate your time here. I really do. Um, to talk a little bit about emotional regulation. I'm going to talk about a little bit, not a lot, um, because you have books about that too. You have a lot. I didn't get to read the happiness box. I really wanted yeah, to. Yeah, well, that's going to come out again soon. It's really out of print now after many reprints we're, we're hopefully redoing it very soon we're going to work on that yeah because that's it's like a classic one of my first books yeah but um two really important books are let's appreciate everyone about teaching about mm -hmm. disabilities in in general children with disabilities are the loneliest children they don't get invited to play dates and to parties like other children. It just doesn't happen. And it's a lot because children who are not as neurodiverse do not know how to interact. Mm -hmm. So this book teaches basic interaction skills. For instance, it's very common with visible disabilities for children to stare when they see someone with a disability. And that's totally fine because you're curious. Right. But if you add if you add another five letter word that also begins with S, you add your smile to your mm -hmm. stare, it changes everything. It oh, creates a bond. That's it's not from me. This is Yael Zellinger made these wonderful workshops teaching children about disabilities. When I read about her workshops, I said, may I incorporate this into a picture book? This is how I wrote the book because I have a grandchild with severe disabilities and everyone said, now you're going to write about disabilities. I said, I'm so not an expert on this. And then suddenly I read this article, learned about her workshops. And this is basically what the book is based on her amazing workshops teaching about disabilities, which is it's just awesome. Yeah, it's opening lots of doors. I, so yeah, yeah, 
you know, I'm a parent, so a parent of an adult daughter with disability. So this is really close to my heart here, first of all. And second of all, I love that you're mentioning the invisible disabilities. So a lot of these books had the child in the wheelchair, the child who's yes. blind, the, child with the hearing yep. impairment. And there are so many kids with invisible disabilities. So I love, and a lot of those kids have social problems and it may be even exactly for them, like my daughter. Exactly. So I love, love, love that. Um, but I also, going back to a book that you can read with your kids and convey to them, this is something we can talk about, right? Yes, exactly. Break it down into the basics. Exactly. Show the basic guidelines. That's what some people, People get all into the complicated and forget to explain the real basics. And that's what children want. They want these guidelines. Just like we love our Torah guidelines, we all need this. We need these really basic information about how to be and how to live a joyful life. So, right, I think you're going to mention my newest book. Okay, go for it. <laughs> don't read, yeah, don't read this book because... It's kind of written by the Yetzirah, and it's about it's about recognizing when the Yetzirah is talking to us. Um, this is something so vital. It took me thirty years to write this book. I wrote it about thirty years ago. I put everything I knew into it, and it wasn't right. Like ten years after that, I added more more things I learned from the Torah and it still wasn't finished. And just recently, the most important wisdom I learned and I put it in and I knew the book was ready now. It's, it's something so amazing. It's, it, it, it gives you a lot of secrets about the Yetzirah, which is what we need to use the Yetzirah's own tricks to outsmart the Yetzirah. And children love doing that. So it's it's a blast. I mean, you know how the Yator will tell you, I just have a little piece, you know, mm -hmm. just have a little piece, you know? Well, we, we can do the exact same thing when we recognize, oh, it's you. The minute we call the Yator by its name, which is um, our inner adversary, it's, it's really the self-destructive impulse that's getting us to do the wrong thing. The minute we notice who's, where that voice is coming from, it loses its power. Right then and there, I, 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 almost every morning in bed, you know, I don't want to get up and having a great time just lying here. Oh, it's you, Yetzirah, <laughs> trying to keep me in bed. I get it. And then I can get up. It's like, whoa, it just like loses its grip on you. So that was one thing. And then, um, oh, yes, another trick of the Yetzirah. It gets you to focus on what you're lacking. What are you missing? You've got everything. It gets you to focus on the one thing you don't have. It's, it's unbelievable how, how effective it is at that. So you, you can do, use its tricks in the, ex oh yeah, I get what you're doing. That changes your whole life. Could you imagine getting that early on in life? So the biggest revelation is the end of the book. And this is what only came to me recently. It's recognizing that the Yetzirah is also from Hashem. In other words, it doesn't really want to trick you. It wants you to resist it. Exactly. Right. Right. It wants you to overcome it. It's rejoicing with you every time we overcome and break through a bad habit. Could you imagine? That was the biggest revelation to me. And then I knew the book was ready to share with young children. But, but the secret to writing children's books, the secret is that you get your message out to every single age level. The little children, the parents reading the book to the children, the grandparents reading it, teachers, and even the teens that read it when no one's looking, you know, <laughs> see it laying around there. <laughs> you know what I love? And, and thank you for sharing me um, a copy of that book. Um, so it was helpful so I can know what you're talking about. Because <laughs> I'm like, okay, don't read this book. I won't read it. <laughs> yeah. It's such a cute title. It's adorable. I think, though, this is very important how you read it and how you discuss that book. Because I still come back to potential religious guilt if it's not done right. What I love about it is what you've done is you've said, you're good. You're good through and through, right? That desire yes. to do the wrong thing is something external to you, not you. And yes. that can be 
eliminating unnecessary and inappropriate guilt. It takes away, the, the, when I wrote the book originally, it felt scary to me. No, the Yetzirah, we don't have to look at this as something scary. It actually loves us. It real, And that changes the whole tone. You know, it changes everything in life. We are good. The purpose of life is good. Hashem, really, what are we here for? To experience gratitude. That's our, that's our purpose for being here, to enjoy this amazing, the abundance of all the gifts in our life. This is what I want to give over through all my books. That's really the essence. Yeah. That is so, so beautiful. And I have to thank you so much. I have had such a great time talking to you. Oh. And I want to thank you for everything you've been doing for our children. And it's it's it, it's a total <laughs> joy. We, we, you know, when you help other souls to shine, it helps your soul to shine. So I'm, it's it's a total joy for me. Yes, I can see it's radiating out of you. <laughs> thank so I want to thank you so much and wish you a good Shabbos. You too. May you be blessed with a wonderful Shabbos. Amen. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Joma Preventative Health Podcast. If you've enjoyed this, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and share this with your friends. For more information, check out our Instagram at Joma underscore org. Check out our website, www.joma.org, that's J-O-W-M-A dot org, or email us at health at joma.org.